right. We theoretically are live. Maybe. If so, <laughs> let us know in the chat that we are live. I am Brandon Sanderson, one of your authors for the evening. And we actually have uh, Nick Martell joining us. I'm really excited about this because um, Nick uh, wrote a really great book. He just had it come out last year, um, City of Liars. Yep. Um, and uh, we share an agent. Uh, my agent, Joshua, sent it to me early. So I got to read it before everyone else. Paperback launched like a month or two ago. Yeah, January. Um, and so, I don't know, it's, uh, it's cool to have you on, partially because one of the things that um, this stream, mostly I like to talk about writing topics and help new writers and things like that. One of the things that is hard for me to talk about is the longer we get from when I broke in, the less things are like how they were when I broke in, which makes sense. But sometimes I talk about, oh, you do this and you do that. And then I realize it's been almost 20 years since I was doing those things. And the world's just a very different place now than it used to be. Um, so I wanted to have Nick on um, to just kind of talk about what it's like to sell a book uh, in the 2020s and release a book in the middle of a pandemic and uh, things like that. Why don't you like tell us a little bit about yourself and pitch the book uh, for everybody who's who's watching. Yeah, so um, I'm Nick. Uh, I've been writing since I was in like fourth or fifth grade. Uh, I wrote a book every two years starting in fifth grade after I just like got hooked on reading and writing. I did that rather than pay attention to school, which is not really something I would say others should do, but it, <laughs> I guess it worked for me. It's working um, out for you, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the, I guess the central pitch of the Kingdom of Liars is it's set in a city where magic costs memories to use. And it's the story of a disgraced noble who has to deceive everyone around him to determine whether his father killed the child prince. Uh, and yeah, it's got cool magic. It's got a shattered moon on the cover uh, and in the book. And it's kind of that blend of like sci-fi fantasy that I really like. So <laughs> It was really fun. Um, I particularly like the world building. Um, but you use it well, right? World building is yeah. nothing without an interesting character or characters to frame everything around. Um, and you did it the way that I like to see where like the world building is um, uh, integrated really well and essential to how the plot pay plays out, right? Like yeah. it's not just there for flavor. It's a story you couldn't really have told in any other genre. Um, and you did a really good job with it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, to me when I was creating it, I really liked when I was thinking like, well, what's the most interesting thing I could kind of do with magic that I haven't seen before? And taking away people's memories was something I was like, oh, this is really cool, and it gives me a lot of avenues to explore like how it relates to the characters. Uh, because yeah, it's a really them... nice, nice cost, really narratively and character uh, significant, uh, which is something that is really fun to see. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I love it. It's, you know, it's my, like, it's really fun to write. It's also, like, a big uh, pain sometimes, considering I'm like, well, what's that character yeah. forget? Like, at the last yeah. again? I'm like, oh, I got to keep a spreadsheet of everything that happens. <laughs> See, that's why I have people to do that for me. <laughs> I don't have to do that myself anymore. Um, you guys can go read uh, Karen's Facebook page. She's my continuity editor for all the complaints about things that I for forget, because I don't have to remember anymore. Um, some people I know in the chat were asking if Nick is one of my students. Nick is not. I actually, this is the first time I have met Nick. Uh, yep. I read his book two years ago, I guess now, a um, yeah. year and a half ago, maybe, um, and uh, had never met him um, and might have met if the pandemic hadn't happened, right? And we yeah. might have ended up at cons together or things like that. Um, but uh, I kind of feel bad for you launching a book in the middle of the pandemic because man, um, normally in situations like this, books pick up and sell better, right? Everyone's trapped at home. But it turned out during the pandemic, that didn't happen, uh, at least to uh, at least looking at my sales. Like sales dipped when the pandemic happened, which is uh, unusual for this type of, uh, of world event. But I think everyone was just too stressed uh, for books. They were binging Tiger King and not reading uh, – novels as much and it bounced back for me by about june july um but i don't know how it went for everyone else so 
releasing in a pandemic, um, man, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that experience. You have yeah. a very unique experience. It, it, it's definitely unique. I feel like I, I get to tell stories about it probably for the rest of my life about like how it was. Uh, the, the, I didn't know where to begin where it was just, there were so many different factors that it kind of changed how publishing like also was operating at the time because there were things that you just couldn't do anymore. Like I couldn't go into bookstores. Right. I, my book, despite releasing in June, didn't show up in certain bookstores. So three weeks later, just because there were shipment issues. So oh, right wow. there, yeah. it was a huge blow. I couldn't sign books. I couldn't like go talk to like the people who were selling the books. Uh, well, and you're with Josh, Joshua, which if people don't know, my agent Joshua, our agent Joshua, one of his sure. big things is get in the bookstores and make the bookstore employees sign the books, talk to them. Like he pushed me hard on that when I was a new author and you just couldn't do that, man. Yeah. And that was one of the hardest things because uh, right up until like things started shutting down, I was supposed to go to New York because I grew up on Long Island. I was like, oh, I'll do it. Hit all up all these bookstores. I had a local right. place that was stocking my book. He was going to be like, oh, let me have you sign some books. Like we'll come down. We'll do a nice event. Yeah. And suddenly like within a day, it was all gone. Like there was like, this isn't happening. This isn't happening. It was like, slowly ticking down like nope nope oh, nope man. nope nope uh, oh man that is rough and i didn't even think about the delays right like um the the stormlight book this year which is one of the biggest books that the publisher will publish right it was almost delayed right yeah. like nobody could get paper and things couldn't get shipped and all of the the shipping you know was needed for essential medical uh uh, paraphernalia and things like that. And so, uh, you know, on one hand, we're glad that people were getting their medical paraphernalia, but boy, the bookstores couldn't launch your book. Uh, yeah. That's rough. One of the things I was told, which kind of framed it to me, was like, uh, because it released in like May and June, they were like, look, Stephen King is having issues getting his books out. And that's Stephen King. And I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, there's, there's no way all of us who are deb debuting during this time, let alone publishing any books are going to have any fun it's kind of just like all right we're going to do it the best with what we can and how do we like go from there have you been trying like any digital marketing and things like that that's been working for you or what have you tried out besides you know showing up on brandon's blog or live stream <laughs> well the biggest thing honestly it seemed that worked for me is just word of mouth by like a book bloggers and things that uh, because of how like uh, kind of it's hard to get your name out there, hard to get your book out there and hard to get any information about there because social media for a long time was just people being like, uh, like talking about the pandemic and it kind of felt like shouting to the void. So a lot of these like book bloggers who came out said, oh, well, I've got a copy of your book. I'm going to read it. I'm going to talk about it. Like they were the most valuable part that I saw. Like people would be like, oh, I can buy that once they wanted to get into reading. Um, and it that's honestly the thing that worked out the best for me um there's things like going on to like social media sites like reddit fantasy which worked out well um we tried to yeah tried they're to a good good group over there at r slash fantasy um yeah they they do a good job kind of focusing on newer authors and uh different things like that i've really appreciated the work they do for the new people launching because the the thing is this is probably not uh fun for you to hear but from what i understand like it's just been hard to launch authors even the last five six years even without the pandemic um it's gotten a lot harder because we've lost a number of our bookstores and uh bookstores are great for new authors right like yeah. being able to buy on amazon um or at costco or things like that that's fine for someone like me where someone's walking in knowing they want to buy my book um, but to find new authors, we rely on browsing the shelves. We rely on those bookstore employees picking up a book and reading it and being like, oh, yeah, you should try this this author, things like that. And so um, it's really been a lot rougher than it used to be to, to launch authors. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I found out while we were, this whole like, pandemic thing was going on was like Barnes & Noble had changed how it was buying books. Uh, oh, yeah. And Jim Killen left. Right. That's yep. right. He'd been their book buyer for, for sci-fi fantasy for like 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, they, and they changed they entirely. Changed. What did they do? Do you do you know or did you, know, I, you just know there was an upset? I from what I understand is that they not they're not buying as much sci-fi and fantasy as they used to. 
Um, and if they are, they're buying it from more of like the bigger names rather than like debuts or right. even mid authors. Um, and that's a huge thing. Like the way it was explained to me is like, say there are a thousand Barnes and Noble stores. Say they buy three thousand copies of your book. Say that you're they're probably going to keep maybe seventy like seven hundred and fifty in their like warehouse just so they can ship it out online. Then you maybe have two books in each store, maybe that's how it yeah, works. Yeah, if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it was—it's just the numbers don't work, and you look at them, and you're like, "This is something beyond my control." Like, and mm -hmm. he was—he left right before, like right around the pandemic happened, and I was sitting there being like, "All right, like this changes things, but there's nothing I can do." Uh, and Man. a lot of authors I talked to felt the same way, where we all had these things, where it's like okay these things are changing what do we do now like how do we change it and it's it's figuring it out <laughs> rough um what's happening there also kind of behind the scenes is that the midlist is getting swallowed up a little bit by self-publishing uh, and yep. indie publishing uh which in some ways for the industry for the the reader is good because it's offering a lot more variety but what it means is, is it's pushing the bookstores and the publishers more into a bestseller mentality because those kind of staple sold well but didn't hit the bestseller list books um, are kind of appearing in the self-published realm more often now. Um, and what that does is it's making it harder for a mid-lister or for a new author, which counts as a mid-lister, right, until they build up their audience and things like that. Uh, there's just fewer of them being carried in the bookstores. And it's, it's actually kind of bad for the genre in this regard. Like, I don't m mind that indie authors are, are doing really well. Uh, that's great. But the bookstore is kind of learning some wrong lessons from this, I feel, and the publishers, because um, bestseller mentality is going can only take us so far. We need people to replace the bestsellers when they slow down or when they uh, stop publishing or things like that. And yeah. Um, by the way, I should mention to people what I'm doing, what's going on. There's a reason I have only one earbud in. Uh, Adam has the other so that he can uh, listen in on the conversation. That's, uh, that's my publicist slash uh, video producer here. So he can actually take questions from you guys in the chat. Um, so if you have questions, uh, for Nick's going to be with us for the first hour. So theme your questions here for a new author just breaking in. Uh, I think Nick can have some really good information that I just can't give you. Um, and so be, be throwing those questions out. Adam will start grabbing the best of them and have them in waiting. I've got like one or two more questions from Nick, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm signing, uh, looks like mostly Stormlight books today. Uh, you guys bought all the ones I signed last time. So I was going to sign Leatherbounds today, but they, the store's like, no, no, we need this. So I'm just going to be switching between seats where they're preparing tables for me. And I'm just going to be signing away as I, uh, as I'm what to do. Um, and so before I go to the other table here, Nick, um, so I want to ask kind of the standard questions. How did you, how did you meet Joshua? how did you get an agent? Um, what was the, the book selling process for you? Did you try, um, indie publishing? Did you try, um, selling your book without an agent first? Like kind of that generic, I know you probably had to answer this question a billion times, but it's really useful for people to hear <laughs> how a new author is breaking in right now. Yeah, uh, so I met Joshua actually at a convention called Balt uh, at uh, Bosco. Um, and I had, was talking to another writer uh, there, and he's like, oh, you want me to introduce your, you to my agent? Like, he's going to be here. I'm like, yeah, sure. He's like, oh, yeah, here, this is Joshua. And we started chatting. Uh, and Joshua, uh, being Joshua, is like, all right, here's my card. Send me your book. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I had sent my book, didn't hear anything from him. Like, oh, he must have hated it went to a different convention and ran into him again, instantly saw him and he's like, oh, I got to read your book. And I was like, oh, hi, Josh. Oh, <laughs> nice, to, nice to meet you again. And what he did was we were talking about comics and he pulled out his iPad. And at the time I was like, oh man, I'm boring him. I'm like, I must be boring him so much. And he's pulling out his iPod as I'm talking to him. And he's like, I like this. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I like this. Let's talk, let's go, let's go have dinner. And I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, I like the first chapter of your book. And I'm like, Mm. Oh, you were reading it right there in front of me. And then he, he read the rest of the book. We talked a bunch of revisions later um, because Joshua is a very revision heavy agent. Um, he is. And then he took me on. Um, and he, I remember the time at the day he took me on. He's like, all right, uh, I like what you're doing. I want to want to get into this before anyone else has a chance. And I it was it was awesome. Like I, getting an agent of Joshua's caliber was just. Uh, Joshua is a force in the industry, uh, yeah. and he's a really great guy. 
but it, it's fun to me to hear you kind of start to lapse into a Joshua voice because we all do it. <laughs> um, Joshua has a specific, uh, my team's laughing, has a very distinctive way of speaking. And he's always like, now, Brandon, let's talk <laughs> about sure. what you're going to do with your next book. Yeah, I'm, sure yeah. he's watching. I'm sure he's watching. Yeah. Yep. Joshua knows that, that I, do a, I do a decent Joshua. I'm not the best uh, Joshua. But uh, but you know the the now Brandon is uh, is a thing I hear from him uh, quite a bit. Um, thing I love about Joshua is just the attention he gives to all of his authors. Um, like I always felt where well cared for when I was just Brandon Sanderson before I became Brandon Sanderson, uh, and uh, he's just he's just great. Uh, really yeah. like Joshua. I, um, so yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say I, I really appreciate Joshua. He like is the biggest cheerleader I have. Like if I know if I'm like, oh man, I'm not I don't know how I feel about this book, he'll be very tell me what he feels about the book and I'll be like, all right, I know he's giving me his absolute honest opinion and I Yep. It's incredible. Yeah, and he uh, you know he watches stuff. I, I still remember my um one of my first Joshua experiences with an advocate for me was when he had been told by Tor that Barnes and Noble was taking a certain number of copies of Elantris per store. Um, and back then there were way more stores and way more books were carried. So I think we had a six or an eight copy order in paperback. Um, and he went to the Barnes and Nobles all around in various cities uh, across that week. And he counted how many copies were there. And then he called Tor and he said, they only have four copies at this store, this store, this store, this store, this store. What's going on? And they're like, oh. Um, and they looked and they're like, oh, they, they, got the wrong, uh, they got the wrong order. Either they <laughs> didn't tell us the right thing or they wrote down. But then within a couple of weeks, there were four more copies of Elantris at every one of those stores. Uh, so, you know, just the, the little stuff that he keeps track of. Yeah, um, it's, it's amazing. So, yeah. Tell me, uh, tell me about selling. Did you, uh, you went on sub? Did you, and like before you got Joshua, what things had you tried recently? Um, before I got Joshua, I tried when I was years before that. So I got Joshua when I was 23 and when I was around 17, I think I tried to get, get an agent. Um, I actually got some requests for my stuff, which at the time wow. was really a huge deal. Um, but Man, I realized overachiever. Pretty, and I, I've always wanted to be a writer. So I just kept working mm -hmm. on it. Uh, but at the time, I realized I was just wasn't a good enough writer to get published. So I kind of was like, all right, I'm going to just keep writing and just keep working on it. And I never went down the uh, indie or even uh, the self-published path just because. Oh, we lost we Nick. Just lost them. We'll pull him back up. Um, so, man, 23. When I broke in, everyone was comparing me to Christopher Paolini. Um, and they're like, oh, you're so young like him. I was like 30, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so they must be treating you like you. What, how old are you now? 24, 25? Um, 26 now. 26 now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Are they treating you like this young kid that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's, that's <laughs> fresh, young faced? Um, and I know when I like, I, I got uh, an agent, I was what? Um, I was probably, see, I was 28. When I when I got an agent and when I sold my first book, and they're all like, "You're so young," I'm like, "I'm not 14 years old, young." You don't have to compare me to Christopher Paolini, uh, but anyway. Yeah, uh, Christopher Paolini was actually one of the reasons, like, I thought I could become a writer when I was so young. Mm. He's, he he wrote a book. He published it Aragon at like 18, I think. Well, he wrote it when he was 14, um, was and it, he. Yeah published it uh we'd have to get christopher on here 16 17 self the indie published thing um and a couple years later the random house edition um he's uh, he's a great guy um and he's come on and chatted before but i the timeline i don't have down uh specifically but i think he wrote it when he's 14 and he indie published back when indie publishing was just not a thing like it is today uh it was it was a lot harder you had to you know warehouse your own books you didn't have ebooks so uh, yeah different world uh, what did you do? What did Joshua do? Uh, he went through several rounds of revision with you, I assume, because yeah. as you said, Joshua is revision heavy editor. Uh, and then yeah. what did you do? Did he pick a specific sub? Like sometimes he'll narrow and be like, Where's, I think this is right for here. Or did he send it wide or what happened there? Uh, we, he sent it real wide. I think he sent it, uh, I want to say like 24, 25 publishers. And he did it all in one giant group. He's just like, uh, he sent a message pretty much saying like, I think this book is really good. 
I think you should read it. Go read it. And, uh, you know, when Joshua says something like that to the publishing community, yeah. they listen. They do listen. Yep. Um, so the my sub process, and I, I really need to state, like, this is atypical, like, really atypical. I had a deal within, like, three days. There's someone offering me a contract in three days. They read it uh, over the weekend. Who'd you end up going with? Um, with Saga Press and Glance. Okay. Saga. Uh, good folks over at Saga. I really like them. Uh, who's, who's your editor? Joe Monty. Okay. Yeah. I know Joe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I've, I have been highly impressed with them uh, all around. So, uh, yeah, so nice. Great, great stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, let's, uh, let's take a few questions unless there's something else you want to talk about, about breaking mm -hmm. in and stuff. No, it's just, it's, it's different than anything I expected. Like you kind of have to take all the lessons from everyone, whatever you heard in the past, like, and you just got to like keep talking. Like it's, it's weird for it to say like publishing is kind of always changing and especially with the rise of like self publishing indie and like you can go right now, you can go and find someone can find their niche of like fantasy exactly what they want and they won't break. They can find that because of self publishing and indie. Uh, so you just kind of have to be just keep talking and keep kind of shouting about your book and that's, fun yeah. and challenging. <laughs> One thing I learned uh, when I broke in, everyone was talking about at that time, like the, why was the sky falling then? It was because of the consolidation of the, um, of the warehousing and distribution. And everyone's talking about how this is the end of publishing. And I was like kind of panicked until someone explained to me, publishing has been perpetually in a state of collapse since the 1800s. Um, and uh, don't listen to it. Publishing is not going anywhere. Movies did not destroy publishing. Uh, the consolidation of hardcover houses and paperback houses, which used to be separate, that was going to destroy publishing. Um, the, uh, the advent of video games was going to destroy publishing. And lo and behold, books sell more now than they ever have. Uh, there are you know, it's still kind of a niche market, right? Like yeah. not as many people read books for pleasure as go to movies or watch television or things, but um, books can be made basically by one person. And so um, beyond that, there are enough readers that like reading books keep selling and they continue to keep selling. Right now it's, uh, it's shifted um, how people are buying and it makes it specifically hard for a new debut, but uh, publishing's not going anywhere. Yeah, uh, that's the nice thing. Yeah, it is. And honestly, one of the things I noticed because of the pandemic, and I don't know if you noticed it with yours, but like my ebooks shot up. And it was really something I wasn't expecting that I, I sold a lot of ebooks just because they couldn't find it in the bookstore or get, get oh, a yeah. copy of it. And it was well, kind of, it caught me off guard. My, uh, my, my audience has always been very heavily ebook and audiobook because of um, the size of the books. Uh, that, drives people to the the uh the digital formats uh because as my writing group likes to tell me these are the books that uh if you fall asleep reading it you could give yourself a concussion if you're laying in bed holding it up <laughs> uh how yours was what two hundred thousand words uh no mine was 150. 150 okay yeah. yeah so not quite not quite one of these behemoths um no. but uh a nice uh, that's actually a really nice link for an epic fantasy like i never felt a lack of world building or anything like there but it didn't overstay its welcome uh it was a really yeah. good read i i at least for me i prefer i like around like the 150 uh at least that's 150 to maybe like just below 200 i think is like an author that like it's nice and concise you can get a story out of it without yeah. like being like, all right, I'm in here for long haul. I remember the first time I wrote Way of Kings. I'm like, all right, let's do this. It's it's a, lo a long book, uh, but I love. Yes, it. yes, oh. it is. <laughs> the the Stormlight books are slightly self indulgent. I will admit. Um, let's uh, let's do some of these questions. Adam, why don't you pop those up for me so I can see? Uh, so oh. you, already, oh, you already answered this question. Okay. Um, but some people uh, were hoping that you pitched the book again. There are several hundred more people now than when you pitched the book the first yeah. time. Um, so we tell them that you yeah, try we'll have you do a pitch now and then at seven right before you take off, we'll let you do a pitch then too. Just uh, and it's good to get in the practice of pitching, uh, yeah. pitching your book. 
Um, so yeah, the the Kingdom of Liars is uh, set in a city where magic costs memories to use, and a disgraced noble has to deceive everyone around him to determine whether his father killed the child prince. It's got a lot of like hidden magic. One of the main themes is like they the main characters don't know how to use magic, and they're trying to figure it out. Uh, and it's got cool world building. There's a shattered moon. There's a lot of weird things going on in the city, which the main character resides in. And it's that blend of sci-fi and fancy that I really like. Awesome. <laughs> All right, Adam, hit us with some more questions. Oh, I wasn't sure if you wanted to do anything on the screen. Yeah. Uh, but Maria says, um, Nick, what's something fresh your books bring to the table? And perhaps also tell us a well-loved trunk or two uh, uh yeah i think the main thing my books bring is like a the magic system is different like the magic system is literally just, it costs memories and the main characters are constantly losing them and the main character is is kind of a mess when it comes to his memories he's trying to he, he has one version of events he thinks has happened and while well, another version has happened um it allows me to do a lot of cool things in world building and that i get to show past events future events and stuff like that based on how people perceive them um but i as tropes i really like just like the kind of like the i like anti-heroes so i think my my main character michael is very much uh kind of almost yeah he's an anti-hero and that's how i would describe his like main tropes there's also just very common things like uh they kind of fight a dragon in the first book uh so there's those kind of like twists on the classic fantasy genre while like keeping it like what you'd expect so uh, i love the the whole moon thing like that's an evocative image that dates back to like thundar the barbarian for me yeah. but i don't see people doing often enough um like you see it a little bit in cowboy bebop like i just like that sort of thing right um and it's it, it makes for a really great image uh and you play it into the setting quite well yeah, it's uh, it was it was cool when I when I was creating that I tried to think of something I could do with the setting, um, because ha I always think like when you think of fantasy stories like they have a really cool like magic system they have cool characters but like sometimes I wanted to move away from the settings I'd grown up reading like with something just weird and creative that I can come up with and having a moon that like pieces of it sh are like uh, falling towards the ground in the city and like they wreak havoc on it as like depending on where they hit was something I'm like this is a cool beautiful cool bit a bit of world building while also something my characters can just react to and not react to that shows kind of what they think or like what they believe and it uh, can go in some other stuff that i probably shouldn't talk about here's some spoilers for the next book yep let's not do spoilers um there's a question here ge bennett's asks what got you into writing fantasy oh um the first fantasy series i read were uh was del toro quest and the name of the author is actually escaping me right now um i haven't heard of that del tor quest del tor quest they were like small chapter books oh huh, um, interesting they, were, they must want, have been middle grade then interesting yeah, yeah. they were uh, it's an australian author and i really can't remember the name of her right now um but they were they were just this really just cool story they had like essentially each chapter book was oh they're gonna go find a gem in this weird place like one of them mm -hmm. was like a haunted forest one of them was like in a, a sand a desert covered in like strange monsters and right. I, I just inhaled them and it was the first thing i read uh first like real fantasy thing i read um but one of the things that i think made me want to be a writer was also ender's game uh which is yeah, yeah. it happens to a lot of us yeah, yeah. it's yeah it's, it's ender's it's game <laughs> book yeah yeah um yeah it's interesting to hear you mention that because i know all of the middle grade fantasy and ya fantasy now um because i have kids in that you know and because i've uh kind of do i've dived i have dove in i've i've dived more fully into doing ya and things like that right mm -hmm. um but there's a period and then i knew all the juveniles back before the ya era really when i was young but i missed that slice in the middle where you would have been young um and so i'm realizing wow i don't even know like uh the popular uh fantasy series um yeah uh, adam I looked up the author for us Oh, who was it? Emily Rhoda? Rhoda? Yep. Yep, that's her. Th those books are incredible. Like, she wrote three series of it. One where it's, mm -hmm. like, the main series, and there was, like, another, like, Fallen series. I think 
I remember the third series had like a beautiful dra- dragons on it because it's it's fantasy and like why not put a dragon on the cover and they're just it's just incredible. Uh, but those yeah. were the first. I also grew up reading Harry Potter. Um, I was on the tail end of the Percy Jackson yeah. series. Mm-hmm. Um, those were getting popular right as I was aging out of that kind of yeah those kind of like that age gap for the book. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, my I, kids uh, read the um, the dragon books. What are those called? Wings of Fire. That's uh, what they've been into. Oh, those sound, yeah. I think I've heard of those. I haven't read them myself. Yeah. Though. They're, they're middle grade where the protagonists are dragons. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of your your chosen one, except a group of chosen ones, except they're all dragons. Uh, so they love them. Uh, let's do a couple more questions here. Um, Any of those that you like? Or- uh, yeah, let's. Uh, um, what's the hardest part of being a new author? Another one from J.E. Bennett's. Uh, hardest part of new, being a new author is probably just getting your name out there and finding an audience. Like a lot of when you're debuting kind of feels like you need to develop an audience very quickly, uh, especially with, as we were talking about earlier, like the mid list is shrinking. Um, so it kind of can feel like you need to be faster and like pub- your publishers may expect you to break out quicker than you used to. Like there's yeah. very few authors who are publishing like, multiple series before breaking out some authors like only publish one series or even a few books and then they're like all right i'm not going to be publishing anymore and that's something i think is the most challenging just because it's kind of out of your control at times like a lot of it's luck and when you debut like who you debut against in terms of other authors out there like it's it's yeah. luck. it's a lot of luck honestly which is kind of scary to think about yeah um yeah, I would agree with having heard that from a lot from it. And this even happened back when I broke in. Like, this is not a new thing that uh, it's it's the, the biggest danger of being a new author is just having that uh, first few things you publish kind of die on the vine, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And uh, once once that happens, once you've published a book, you are a known quantity, right? Yeah. Uh, and you can no longer be the the shiny unknown which is uh, very, um, it's very alluring to publishers um, and even to readers. Like, you know, what is this thing? What is this new thing that this new author's doing? Um, and yeah, um, that's always been like the the biggest the biggest danger: getting eyeballs on on you on your stories. Uh, did you do a multi book contract for your first contract? Yep, I have a multi book contract. Yeah um that's so, uh, that's good i would assume that from joshua right yeah. like forcing the publisher to invest a little bit more highly in you because if the first book um doesn't do as well they're still having to publish several more so they have to give it like a, a retry um my first one was a two book contract um oh, okay. and we were able to kind of lean on them to, to push mistborn a little bit harder than they had been wanting to do and that was really helpful for my early career yeah, we're we're kind of able to do the same thing where it's like, all right, mm-hmm. here's we got a few more chances, uh, and it's been yeah. helping that my second book got some pretty good reviews, so we can kind of push a little bit more than just simply mm-hmm. based on the debut. So, yeah, well, they've got to be understanding that during the pandemic, uh, different things or or whatever, and uh, I'm sure you did fine, but I don't, I doubt anybody <laughs> who who launched a book last year did as well as uh, publishers were hoping. Uh yeah, there's like a between i want to say late february and august like early august no author even the ones that didn't debut sold as well as they were supposed to like a lot of authors had issues and it's not our fault and we'll hope the Mm. publishers kind of say uh see that so it'll be interesting to see when a lot of our contracts come up what happens next all right um Serious question. If an aspiring author has an out there dream story, should they try to publish that first or would it be more productive to write a more grounded or marketable story? Uh, that's from uh, um, Ellaby. What do you think, Nick? I would say you write the story you want to write. Like, it's easy to say, like, oh, this is going to be more marketable, but you probably may not enjoy writing it as much and you, it may just not be as what people want to read. Like, writing the book you want to write 
will also just get more attention on you because you may come across an agent who's like, oh, this is exactly what I was looking for. Like, I really like this. And then they'll push it. Like, a lot of breaking into the industry is finding, if you're especially if you're going traditionally, like, I can't speak to self-publish as much, but, like, a lot of traditional publishing is finding people who, like, really believe in your book and will champion it. And then they, it doesn't matter if it's an editor, agent, like, anything like you want to lead with your best foot sort uh, forward so if the dream book is the one you want to write and you you have a really good idea do it don't worry about yeah the and in my experience authors aren't terribly good myself included at in deciding where the market's going to go um yeah. and so i i do know of some success stories of authors who were really savvy with what um what's going on in the market and we're able to say, you know what, I'm going to specifically write something that's very market friendly. Um, the, the biggest success story of that is John Scalzi, uh, who um, John tells the story. Uh, hopefully I'm, I'm not getting it, butchering the story, but he's like, you know what? He said, I want to write a, a book. Uh, what's selling right now? And just went to the section and found the, the books that looked like they were selling. And like, he's like, oh, I could write something like this and went and wrote it. Um, that's John. John's got a got a special view on things. Um, you know, he was already a professional writer, just not a novelist. Uh, he was a professional blogger and he was trained in lots of different writing styles. Um, I would say nine out of 10 times, um, you should just write the thing you're most passionate about because your passion is going to come through. And it's the, that sort of passion that makes books distinctive. Uh, and if you try to write something, I tried to do this before I broke in, I wrote a few books. I thought I was writing the market and they were just they were disasters, absolute disasters. Like um, some of the worst books I've ever written are the books I wrote right before I actually broke out. And it was because of this, right? Um, trying to write to market. So write the, write the book that you're really passionate about. With the caveat that if you really know the market and you really know that the thing that you're writing is, uh, is super niche and you, uh, you kind of have an understanding you're a professional writer already, then maybe you can, you know, yeah. make a call there. Um, I often say if you have two projects you're equally passionate about, uh, kind of trying to decide what might be more market friendly is a, is, is a good tiebreaker. But I don't know. We, we aren't good at this. Like I remember being at World Fantasy Convention in the early 2000s and uh, an editor sitting up there and saying, please don't send me any more vampire books. There are, vampire books are played out. <laughs> Um, and you know, Twilight came out the next year, right? So I don't <laughs> really? even, the editors don't even know, right? Uh, nobody knows what's going to catch the whims of the market. So, um, yeah, let's do another question here, Adam. We'll pull those questions back up. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, uh, for Brendan and Nick by Mar uh, Mariah or Maria or no, Maria says, what are some of the best ways for readers to support authors that might not immediately spring to mind? Well, that's a good question, uh, particularly for someone new breaking in like yourself, right? Like uh, yeah. if people want to support you, let's say they really like your book and they want to support you. Uh, what can they do? Honestly, talking about it um, and telling your friends or people or on social media or like even just like t posting about it. I, I think beyond buying the book, that's really the best thing you can do about it, because the more you talk about something you're really passionate about or like want to support that author, it, it helps them because then people are like, oh, maybe I want to go check this out uh, and they'll do it. Like really talking about a book is the best thing you can do for it because then it doesn't disappear. And the moment a book kind of disappears, like uh, it's hard yeah. to get out of that hole. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, though, uh, and I would say that my career was made by people talking about my books, right? Um, I had more bookstore traction. Um, and the people talking about it were often people in bookstores, which helped me. This was in 2005 through seven, back before the ebook explosion happened in 2010. Um, but even still, like word of mouth is, is how things actually sell, particularly things like this. Um, there's a reason why we don't just do a, very much advertising of books, because there's not really good ROI on advertising of books, but there is fantastic uh, return on people talking about it. Uh, that said, uh, the people here in the stream, I'm going to be willing to bet that there are many of you whose family and friends are tired of hearing about Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I just, I, I just get this sense from people who go to book signings with their friends are like, she dragged me to this. She wouldn't stop talking until I agreed to come to the signing, um, sign the book so she can stop talking about it or things like that. Um, so, 
Uh, maybe you guys can talk about Nick Martell for a while to get right <laughs> and like you know sneak attack them with some more Brandon Sanderson stuff later on. Yeah, it's all about the just like lead with something else and then come right back to it. They'll never yeah, catch. Any arcade? Are they still a thing that people know about? It's a web comic uh, that was very popular. Um, where uh, there is one Penny Arcade comic about me where they're like, the, basically the gist of it is uh, they are so tired, the comic makers, of their friends talking about Brandon Sanderson that they prepared a guide for people who wanted to pretend they had read my books but hadn't. Uh, <laughs> they stop people talking about them. Um, yeah, it, it's actually pretty hilarious. That's uh, awesome. So, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me see if I can think of any other things than talking about it. There are a few authors out there who have uh, Patreons. Um, and um, I don't do one of those. Um, but uh, there are a lot of authors, particularly authors whose uh, books are very well loved but don't land in the market as well. They'll, they do Patreons. Um, they will do, you know, there's other, other ways of supporting though, like just showing up on streams and asking questions is a great way to, you know, it, it gives us stuff to talk about and things like that. Um, but yeah, following authors on social media, engaging with them, like an author getting responses to an Instagram post they've made is like really heartening, right? Then you're like, oh, it's <laughs> out there who've read my book and care what I have to say, rather than you just releasing stuff into the void. Like maybe it doesn't help you sell books, but it certainly helps you feel like you're actually doing something that it's not emptiness out there. Yeah, the best thing is those like few people who are like constantly like interacting or like retweeting your stuff and like, ah, oh, thank you, you see me. Like, this is awesome. Like you, I don't, I've never met you, but like, oh, I really appreciate it for everything you do. Like, this makes you feel like warm and fuzzy inside. Yep, it's really easy to feel invisible um, when you first release those early books. Yeah. Um, yeah, and particularly since you can't do a lot of the things that normally we do, right? Like I went on three book tours with other established authors when I was first breaking in. Um, and basically you got to have events that were much larger than I normally would have because those other authors fans came just to listen to the readings of the, of the three authors. And that was really handy. You can't do anything like that. So. Nope. I was, I was supposed to have an event like that, and it got canceled. I was supposed to be yeah. attending conventions where conventions are great if you can attend them or your publisher will send you to them because then, obviously, a lot of people will be there, and you can just be like, hey, buy my book. It's also a great opportunity yeah. to like, meet other writers. Um, yeah. But all these things are kind of, uh, let's say, on hold for a, a little bit longer. I don't know, wow. actually, if physical conventions will return. So. Asbjorn asks, what are your thoughts on alternative ways of self uh, alternative ways of publishing books or marketing for the new author? Web novels, YouTube, self-published, self-made audiobooks, social media platforms. Like what social media have you done? Um, what sort of things um, have you been doing to market? And what do you think worked better? What do you think hasn't worked as well? Um, I think the best thing, uh, the things that seem to have worked better are interacting with people just on like say if you read it instagram or like twitter are the things because then they'll talk about it they'll be reading it that's even the best thing there's like targeting marketing kind of works um i feel like it gets your book out there but it may not hit the right audience like one of the things we noticed was like at least i noticed in the like we had a goodreads giveaway for the book um it got in some time it ends up people who are like i don't read fantasy and i'm like I, how what am I supposed to do about this? Like, I'm sorry. Like, I, I didn't know you're getting it either. Yeah. Um, and those kind yeah, of things. I love those reviews. Yeah, those those are things that are just completely outside of your uh, like my control or something. Um, so those things work. It's honest. It's like going, having a YouTube channel. If you have one, would be great to talk about it. But at the same time, if you create a YouTube channel just for the sole instance of like, oh, I'm gonna go write. I'm gonna do this to sell my book. Like you have to put as much passion into like a YouTube channel as you do writing and then you're not writing as much. Um, and then that's a whole different issue. Like uh, it's, it's kind of like a never ending cycle. You got to do this to this, to this. Um, so that works. Instagram accounts. Like if I'm not an artistic person, I'm in awe of the people who can like make those like beautiful pictures of books. I wish I could do that. I can't. Uh, so I kind of just post my pictures. I'm like, 
uh, hopefully people like them. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it, it's hard to tell what works and what doesn't because sometimes I don't see what works. Um, like sometimes like being active in groups, like people will be talking about the book and then I'll be, have someone message be like, oh, I came across your book because of blank. And I'm like, I didn't know blank was talking about me or like, I didn't know this was going on. Uh, so it really just, it, it really does feel kind of like throwing a bunch of darts at a dartboard and hoping you kind of hit the center, not knowing where the center on the board is. It's really baffling when some random celebrity picks up your book and likes it and then tweets about it. And someone's like, yeah, um, I'm here because such and such talked about your book. And you're like, who, what the big show that happened to me. I'm like pro wrestler. That's awesome. Uh, I had no idea. Um, and those sorts of things just kind of happened randomly. Right. Uh, yeah. so, uh, I'm, we're getting some questions like this one from Iceman zero asking, uh, what do you plan to run right after the series? How long is the series that you're working on? Um, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. So the series is current, like the series, uh, the, it's called the legacy of the mercenary King. Uh, it's a currently planned five book series. So hopefully, you know, I'll get to the end of the story. Uh, I designed it in a certain way that it kind of ends. It ends in three, like at least a certain part of it does. So but I can't really talk about that part um, as much. Um, the, but the next thing I kind of want to write after I finish this, I might actually try to push it after I finish the third book because it's in my head and I can't get rid of it. Um, okay. Is this kind of like standalone? Yeah, the standalone fantasy. I've been like really, I've been writing it kind of on the side when I'm supposed to be writing my third book. And sometimes I'll get, I'll talk to Josh and be like, yeah, I really like this book. Like the thing I'm working on the side of like, Nick, you got to finish this book you contracted for. And I'm like, I know, but like, I also kind of want to write this thing. Um, and I, I can't really, I don't, I can't, I'm not contracted for it, but it's really mm -hmm. cool. Uh, I guess the, the premise, the pitch of it would be it's someone trying to kill someone in a world where death stops existing. Ah, uh, cool. That's a great premise. Yeah. Like I'm really liking where it's headed. Um, and hopefully I get to write it next. <laughs> mm. Joshua just absolutely loves it when uh, his authors show up with books that he didn't plan on them writing and that he hasn't <laughs> sold and he doesn't know what to do with. Uh, you can ask him about it sometime. There's some, there are some authors out there who just, uh, who just uh, continuously do that to him. Um, no. we, we, we actually had to talk about that because um, yeah. a few months ago, I was like, oh, I've been writing, like, oh, it was actually before the pandemic. I yeah. sent him the first chapter of this thing. I'm like, Joshua, what do you think about this? And he read it. And he's like, I like it. And he's like, Are you writing it right now? And I'm like, Yeah. And he's like, Don't don't do too much. I'll just finish finish this first. Maybe work on the side a little bit. Just like finish this first. And I was like, Okay, I'll, I'll work on this. And I've been still slowly writing it on the side. Mm. It's like a surprise. Away from, he 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 has firsthand experience of how this can go. <laughs> I sent him a picture book like last year and I'm like, Hey, sell this. He's like, what? <laughs> what? So, you know, I, I've always kind of been hoping for just like randomly sending Joshua a book and be like, Hey, this is done. Like uh, you yeah, have no idea what's coming. Your job now, sell this book. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, this is either for Nick or from Nick or both. Um, can you please talk about the process of getting cover quotes as a new author? Did you have specific authors in mind? So for those who know, these are the blurbs that go on the front of the book or inside cover with other authors gushing about how great the book is. Um, I don't think, yeah, we don't, um, we, we only use one nowadays. We use Pat's uh, Rothfuss's. Um, but uh, in the early days, like those were, those are one of the things that we, that Tor, my publisher really liked. Um, and we hunted quite aggressively. I'm curious how it went for you. Yeah, so a lot of the blurb process was um, I kind of was out of it for a decent amount of it. I knew vaguely who has had my book. Um, like Joshua told me, like, for instance, he's like, oh, Brandon has your book. And I was like, mm -hmm. OK, I hope he likes it. Um, but honestly, most of that I was out of it for just because, uh, especially nowadays, that a lot of authors just like will get sent so many books, especially by debuts. Um, when the V is like in publishing, it's a big thing to get blurbs. Um, because it tells them kind of like tells publishing how much like people are excited for the project. Um, so they, the publishers were really wanting to send out wide, but the thing is when you send out so wide for people, sometimes like authors just won't have the time to read it. Um, and 
have there's many authors who probably have my books sitting on their table somewhere uh than I actually like read it just simply because they didn't have the time to and so yeah. when we were doing the blurb process um my agent editors kind of said hey we're sending out to like this many we have this many people we think we're sending out uh we'll let you know who who says they have who's read it and who wants to blurb it um and they kept me out of it uh then i got really uh, excited news when things just came in <laughs> yeah uh just to let you know joshua probably told you this but yeah. um i've been joshua's client for 18 19 years now and yours is the first time he called me and said i would like you to read this if you uh <laughs> if you would and so i did right like yeah. um uh, he, he is very discerning. And for those who don't know, what happens is usually reading a book is done kind of as a favor or, or things like this. Blurbing it is not, right? Um, you don't blurb a book unless you want to blurb the book. Uh, there is never this sort of quid pro quo that you have to, that it's expected that you will, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. All the favors get called in to get people to actually read them. Um, but... Um, uh, I actually hunted almost all of my own blurbs when I was new, but I was very connected in the con scene. Um, and I was pretty good about going and meeting authors and things like that. Uh, and so all of the blurbs you see on my books, I got myself um, by just going to the author and saying, hey, would you be willing to read this? Um, and if you like it, give me a blurb. Um, the, the only one that was sent to that wasn't me um, was actually my editor at the time was really good friends with George Martin and sent him the book. And George actually read it, uh, read Elantris, but he did not blurb Elantris, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm not surprised by. It's just not like usually you want your name on a book that is similar to the way you write so that yeah. your fans say, oh, if Brandon blurbs a book, it's kind of saying, hey, this is a Brandon-ish sort of book. Um, and I will like that. Uh, and George actually wrote me a very complimentary note saying, I think you're a good writer. Uh, this is too high magic for me. I don't, I really don't like things that, uh, that revolve, they, you know, Launchers, my first book revolves around a magical mystery of how does the magic system work? He's just like, I'm just not into that. Um, yeah. and very nice little notes. I've always respected George for reading the book and then not blurbing it. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it just makes, it makes blurbs also more valuable from people like that. Like I know now that if I see a George Martin blurb, I know that George like legitimately um, want, thinks that his fans will like that book. Uh, so there, there are authors out there that, uh, that, that I know are really discerning with their blurbs and I respect them for it. Uh, yeah. It's blurbs are also interesting in that the fact that like different authors will like blurb different things, but they also support books in different ways. A lot of things, once you start talking to authors, like some authors will be like, I don't want to blurb this, but I'll promote it on social media. I'll talk about good right. things. Um, just in, recently, I, I blurbed a book that I really enjoyed and I talked about it on social media and I had an editor come back and be like, hey, can, can we use like what you talked about on social media as a blurb? I'm like, yeah, sure, I loved it. Um, but all, some authors will have that line between like what they'll right. talk about on social media and blurbing because it's like you said, it's for their audience. Like if they may not think their audience will like it as much as they did, they won't put their name on it despite maybe loving it themselves. The line I have to put is generally for my students because I'll grade their pay, their finals and I'll say nice things about them and they'll come back and be like, can I use this to blurb? And I'm like, that's not what this is for, right? Yeah. Like uh, I am not looking at this as an author blurbing something. I'm looking at it as a professor trying to give you compliments on what you do well. Um, there are a few students I've blurred, but they have all been students who've had books come out, right? Um, and then I read the book that was out and said, yes, this is, and you know, it's, uh, it's pretty likely that I'm gonna like one of my student works because you know, they self-selected into taking my class and things like that. But, um, but I do have to kind of watch that line. I blurb a lot less than I, um, than I used to because that just getting that everything read, right? Like it is so hard to keep up on my friends' books, uh, let alone all the, the authors coming out. I generally do a thing where I try to read like the first book by author so I at least know what they're about and what what's what's up with them um, and and things like that. But yeah, um, it is it is interesting. And I wonder how how important much how if it's as important as it used to be, uh, because one of the things is blurbs are more relevant, I think, when you're browsing on the shelf and you pull out the book and look at the cover, um, because the blurbs like on Amazon and stuff, they're buried deeper uh, you have to scroll down and stuff. Um, and, you know, 
uh, getting getting cover blurbs from like uh, you know like the Robin Hobb one that we still have on the front of my Mistborn book. I consider that a triumph because I love Robin Hobb's work, uh, and I was very nervous going and asking her. Um, and I'm like, no, we're leaving that blurb. I worked so hard for that blurb. Um, uh, and she, she read it because her daughter really liked the books and she's like, okay, you're, my daughter's spoken to this. And this was like years after like the books had even been published, I got yeah. that blurb. But, um, I, I feel like they're just, they're not quite as relevant as they used to be, but published shows still treat them as relevant. And I think what you said is probably still, uh, useful. It's like, they know if it's getting traction among authors and things like that. It's important for the publicity team to know that other authors like this book. Um, it's like external validation or something. Yeah, and it's kind of the same thing about like major publisher reviews, like say Kirkus publishes weekly and stuff. Like that, that's different too. Like how publishers will see that is like, um, like readers may not respond to them as heavily as like the publishers do, but they also yeah. give you some amazing quotes to put on the book that will pick up readers' eyes when you when they. They're really are important uh, for libraries and librarians ordering the books, uh, all of those things. How is Kirkus to you? They are always uh, to me. Kirkus, for my second book, gave me an absolutely glowing review. They yeah. actually called me the uh, the future of epic fantasy. Uh, Ooh, nice. Which, uh, which you know, the moment that came yeah. in, my editor was like, putting that right on the the front yep. of the. That's gonna be on the front of your covers for the next twenty years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I've I've been having Kirkus has always liked my books, um, which is nice. Um, and it's, it's just an awesome feeling. I remember when that, that quote came in, I was like, uh, are, are you sure that's what they said? Like, are, are, can we, can I double check? Um, but yeah, it's the, that was an amazing blurb, uh, review. I For still, those who don't know, in the industry, Kirkus is the snarky one. Generally, Kirkus is the one, if you want to read reviews to get a smile, uh, read Kirkus Publishers Weekly, I love them, but they're, reviews tend to be more middle of the line. They don't hate as many things. They don't love as many things. Kirkus tends to be uh, a little more divisive in their choices, and they tend to publish uh, one-liners in the reviews about books. Uh, <laughs> kind of an old-school uh, um, like movie reviewer type way that you might see have seen uh, Ebert do or something like that. Yeah. We are running uh, out of time here. Um, so why don't you uh, pitch us your book again. Give us your social media stuff, uh, and add anything in that you want to want to say. Um, uh, and I actually, we can add into this. Um, why don't you part by giving encouragement to new writers trying to break in now? Because I'm seeing some questions come through saying uh, they're inspired by the fact that you did it. <laughs> it's not <laughs> possible. Um, yeah. And in some encouragement, how's that sound? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so. King of Liars, the pitch of it is set in a city where magic costs memories to use. A disgraced noble has to deceive everyone around him to uh, figure out whether his father murdered the child prince. It's got a shattered moon. Um, it's got a lot of secrets. And I pride myself on the fact that I got Joshua, um, my agent, to admit that every time he read it, which he read it multiple times during the revisions, he found something new. And... Uh, you know, that's always an exciting thing where someone who reads it, reads it multiple times, finds different things each time they read it. Um, so I was really proud about that. Uh, and it's fun. It's got a different kind of main character that you may see in traditional fantasy. And yeah, it's a, I like it. It's a great book. Sequels even better in my head. Um, uh, social media first. Yeah. Uh, so my hashtag, uh, my handle on Twitter is, uh, Mac Martell. Just M A C and then M A R T E L L. And on Instagram, I'm just Nick Martell official. Uh, and those are the two ones I'm on. I'm on Reddit as Nick Martell, but uh, you don't really do you look for the users' accounts in that one as much. Um, and then encouragement for new writers. Um, yeah, the best thing I do is just keep writing books. I want to say The Kingdom of Liars was my seventh or eighth book I wrote. Uh, while I was writing, that, that sounds about right. Um, and what I did, and I don't know if this is good advice, but it worked for me, is I kind of took everything that I liked about each previous book and kind of scrapped it for the next book. I was like, oh, I really liked what I did there. All right, I'm, I'll just bring it to the next one, destroy this setting, destroy this world, destroy these characters, take this one thing, keep going. Um, and I did that. 
seven or eight times and just kept rewriting different books all with like one connecting thread be like oh i took this from the first one took this from the second one took this one from the third one hmm. and i never heard anyone doing that before that's really cool yeah. Yeah, it was fun because then I you kind of have those things where I'm like, that survived all the way to the final version. Like, I can still have my old writing from, like, fourth and fifth grade being like, oh, wow, how did that character survive that long? Like, they're completely different, but the name stayed the same. Um, yeah, just keep writing, keep reading. Like, reading is just as important as writing. Uh, and, yeah, just, just keep writing. That's really the best advice. Like, it sounds so cliche, but it really is. Like, you just keep writing to be a writer. Well, thanks for stopping by, Nick. Um, yeah. yeah. You talked about starting YouTube channel. I just started mine so that I could keep being entertained while <laughs> I sign these big stacks of books. So I appreciate you um, putting up with this. It's a kind of a weird thing. It's probably the weirdest interview you will have um, where someone is sitting and sign, uh, signing stacks of books while you talk to um, him and his audience. But uh yeah, keep going, man. Uh, we'll, we'd love to have you back sometime in the future. Let us know how it's going. Um, yeah. And uh, it's a really great book, guys. Uh, it has a cover blurb from Brendan Sanderson. I don't know. Did I get on the front? Did I get on the back? You did. Where am I? Uh, you, I can show you right here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I'm right there. Yeah. Yep. That, that is a great cover. Um, yeah. Like I, I've given my friends a bunch of blurbs and there, there's a running thing that I always end up buried somewhere hidden in it uh, because someone else comes along. Like I give them a blurb and then like Stephen King does, they're like, whoop, whoop, here. Uh, so, so it's always fun when, when I actually get to be on the front. Uh, yeah. uh, take care and uh, we'll see you again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was really yeah. a lot of fun. There you are guys. Um, let us know if, uh, if that's the sort of thing you'd like to see more of, just grabbing new authors. Like I've told you, um, my I'm going to pull out the, the air thing and give it back to Adam now. My, one of my bigger worries is that my advice will calcify the longer I keep going and publishing, right? That, that the way that I, uh, that I did things when I broke in, back in the good old days uh, just isn't relevant anymore. Uh, and so I like trying to bring on things like new authors and whatnot. Uh, but uh, Nick was uh, only scheduled to stay with us for an hour. Uh, I think he's got something else to go off and do. So uh, we'll go ahead and let me entertain you for the rest of this stream. So uh, go ahead and start throwing some questions at Adam if there are things you want to hear from me. Uh, kind of more rare these days that it's just Brandon because uh, we like to have guests, uh, you know, be charming and interesting and things like that. Um, so, yeah, you know, whatever you guys are curious about today, uh, non-spoiler questions, though. We'll try and do another spoiler stream here uh, soon enough. Uh, Adam gets to decide when those things happen. Yeah. So we're going to start off on uh, on the highest note we can. Ooh. Um, and I already know the answer. Mm. So I don't even know why I'm bothering. Uh, but Joe, our good friend Joe Deer, uh, oh. Deer says, would you rather golf with Adam or listen to Kathy ramble about her cats? I would pick golfing with Adam for sure. Uh, definitely. For those who don't jo know, Joe is... Uh, uh, a friend of ours who's the, the resident reptile expert who helped Dallin uh, pick a tortoise to have. So we are quite fond of Joe and his his good reptile advice. Um, so we he loves that tortoise, Joe. Uh, you did some good work helping us get a hold of that and take care of it and keep it alive. I, I actually took golf lessons when I was a y young man. Um, I, um, I do know how to golf. I am not good at golfing, but as I understand, golfers don't think they're good at golfing. So that's, a uh, that's not too surprising that, uh, I'm not that good at golfing. Um, I think if you asked most people who are good at golfing, they would say that they're bad at golfing and they hate it. Oh, I've golfed with plenty of people who said they were good at golf. Oh yeah. Who proved me wrong. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's there's some really yeah fun people to play with. Okay, I've been putting myself in that category mm. as well. Well, you always talk about how much you hate golf. Uh, yes, I I hate nothing more, and I love almost nothing more. Yeah, yeah. it's the worst hobby mm -hmm. uh, that I could never 
uh, Shane from Facebook says, I bet Moash plays golf. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway. Hit, hit me. What you got? So, uh, and to answer just a girl on YouTube, no, you will not hear a song from me tonight. Oh, yes. That was a from, a from Brandon special. Santoki? Yes. Ah, uh, Santoki. Okay. Well, uh, if you didn't pick to go golfing with me, mm -hmm. uh, you would never pick it again. Oh, yeah? Well, Probably you would not. swear too much. I'd be uh, like, Ooh. Maybe, maybe. I. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So Jeremy says, your work on the lore of the Cosmere is immense. How much have you had to figure out ahead of time? And how much do you develop on the fly while writing? Uh, it really depends on the situation. Um, I do some of both, right? Um, mostly the on-the-fly stuff is where I realize that there is a hole in my understanding where I'm like, I didn't account for this. And you'll see this when, when fans ask me questions. Like, uh, I'd say a good half the time or more, they ask a question. I'm like, I didn't account for that. Let me think. Uh, but this is why I like having kind of foundational principles of how the Cosmere works. Um, rather than focusing on little details, which a lot of those I'm deciding on as I'm writing, I try to get these really solid foundations so that the, the little details like answer themselves, if that makes sense. I've heard people talk about this with characters, right? Like uh, instead of saying, you know, deciding in your, your initial, like when you're building a character, what their favorite color is, like decide who they are. Um, decide the personality, decide foundational moments in their lives. So when someone asks you a question that you haven't anticipated, it makes sense to, there's like only one way you could answer. Well, of course their favorite color is, you know, is blue because that's the color of the uniforms of the soldiers that saved them when they were a young child. So they're going to pick that color, right? Like that sort of thing uh, for world building works really well too. When someone's asked an off the wall question, you can say, well, the mechanics are like this, this, and this. So that leads me to have an answer that is this, um, that you get into more trouble when you assume that's the case. But then when you think about it later, you're like, no, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be that way. And you could go a different way. But uh, that's how I try to, to do it. Um, just from the YouTube chat, uh, oh, I need to scroll back, um, mm -hmm. from Cosmelt is. I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, they say, if someone made a video game based on your books, would you like them to cover the same plots or create new stories in the same world? Um, it really depends on the book, honestly. Um, like, uh, I feel like Stormlight um, would be different from Mistborn in that regard. Um, like, in Stormlight, I feel like I would want to have it be... Um, a story from the books, but maybe not one of the main stories, right? Like, you know, delve into some of the Herald stories or things like that, um, where Mistborn, I feel like, um, I feel like Mistborn is better off not doing the main story of the books. Um, that's just because like, um, boy, I don't know. I'm not even sure if I can explain why. I think it's just a taste thing. Um, in general, I think overall, I would err on something that isn't explicit in the books, but has been mentioned uh, for either of those. But I'd probably go a little further afield in Mistborn and stay a little closer to uh, the characters in Stormlight that have already been mentioned and things like that. Um, and that might just have to do with the fact that Stormlight is pretty expansive and I've touched all parts of the world, um, whereas Mistborn, I haven't explored it as much. And it's like narrowly focused on this kind of one group of people um, in, uh, Dep well, two groups, depending on your era and things like that. And so, I don't know. Uh, it's a good question. Um, would I, that I were so lucky? Oh, fan mail. Great. Uh, would that I were so lucky as to uh, be able to make a, a AAA uh, caliber game um, from one of my books? You didn't say AAA, but that's what I would want to do. Uh, that's just a really hard world. And I don't know if it will ever happen. Uh, I would love it. Movies are way more likely um, than, yeah. Oh, you had already opened this. <laughs> hey, it has a Harry Potter sticker or a stamp. So love that. Um, uh, by the way, while uh, Brandon's reading this, if you'd like to send something to Brandon, you can find the address in the YouTube description. Mm -hmm. Let's see. 
and I guess while you're reading it, I'm seeing a question um, from David asking me what my favorite Sanderson book is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can always say it is the last one I read. Mm. So uh, this is from Brendan, who asked a question about the mechanics of the magic in Stormlight. In the beginning of Way of Kings, Seth, Zeth lashes himself to the wall at the end of the corridor, turning it into something like a deep well, and then he lashes himself back to the floor. So is gravity not necessarily a thing in Roshar? It is. Uh, it is indeed a thing in Roshar. Um, so a lashing overrides gravity. Uh, this is kind of a weird thing that I built it that uh, honestly drives, I think, uh, my continuity people a little crazy um, because um, uh, the way that I work lashings, I didn't always want to have to say that, you know, you're lashing them upward one gravity, gravitational force and then in a direction at the same time, basically to negate gravity and then send them a direction. So I just said, you know what? This is working kind of on um, a, a spiritual uh, realm level where it's overriding gravity's pull and kind of convincing the body it's being pulled in a different direction. Uh, that is kind of what, what the mechanics are doing. And so when you lash to the end, toward the end of the hallway, you lash in a direction usually, um, then gravity is overridden and you are pulled in a specific direction instead. Uh, what Zeth is doing there is when he's lashing himself back downward, he could cancel the lashing. Um, but he um, is just gets into this mindset. Um, you'll see most of the characters do this. It's it's kind of fun functionally identical, um, but that they kind of like which direction is down is not really important to the per person while they're using their lashings and where gravity would pull them. They just are going to be like precise and be like, I'm going to go that direction now. Um, and just kind of get in the mindset of working that way. Uh, so I would say that for someone using lashings, um, gravity doesn't really matter, or it matters entirely too much. Um, but regardless, um, this does lead us into where, where building it that way has led us is when you want someone to just hover, uh, what, does, what do you do? Um, what is the, the conversational uh, sort of... Um, sort of like how do you how do you indicate someone is becoming weightless um and kind of by those mechanics you use a half lashing upward right so that you're still pulled down half as much by uh gravity but you're pulled upward half as much uh there are other ways you could achieve it but that's how i often have people talk about it so if you remember that a lashing is overriding gravity not just um it's replacing it rather than it's not additive um then that helps a little bit with understanding how lashings work. Um, I still like it this way because it's a lot more elegant to describe, but when you break down the mechanics of it, it, uh, it is a little bit harder to, to wrap your mind around. Uh, Marcelo says, how can a non-physical conflict be exciting? How do I escalate tension in social situations or verbal debates between characters? Yeah. Uh, good question. And, um, if you can get good at this, uh, it'll be very advantageous to your stories um, because a lot of times these sorts of situations are just more interesting, more character filled than the quote unquote action sequences, uh, which uh, can get a little bit much for some readers. Uh, I would say that you, you want to remember motivation and stakes, right? Like what you want to do is establish those stakes and those motivations so that we have we have tension. We have. We know what the person is trying to get out of this, and then you try to escalate. So um, one of the ways that you escalate is you have characters try things and have them fail, right? Like when, just like if you were um, trying any sort of problem solving thing, where you're like, "Well, we've got to get through this door. What can we do? Well, we'll try to pick the lock. Oh no, it's you know uh, the lock pick has broken in the lock. We can't do that, right? Like you are you are trying things. And um, having the characters lose time or, uh, you know, uh, run up against running out of uh, choices they can make and whatnot. And you can do the same thing in a conversation where a character's like, I'm pretty sure I can persuade this person to do the thing I want. But then they try and fail. You, you want this to happen for a good reason, right? Don't, don't just have them deus ex wrench, as my friend Bryce um, the, the writer Bryce Moore uh, used to say, which is the opposite of Deus Ex Machina. It's where you have a, 
No, it does not work linguistically. But you have a problem happen to a character in an obvious way that ruins their plans, that the reader feels like the hand of the author came in to make this character fail. Um, you want the failures to make sense. They, you want them to, to be relevant. Um, and you want them to usually try good things and then you know smart things and have them not work for equally interesting world building or you know, narrative reasons. And if you do this right, then each time you try that, the character can get a little more frantic. And that's uh, the next tip I would give you is that the reader will follow the character's focus and the character's uh, feelings about things. If the character is like completely confident the whole way through and doesn't feel like there's going to be any problem, the reader will respond to that differently. Uh, you can still write a scene like that that's engaging. Um, that usually, you have to use some other method than are they going to fail, like that, that tension. But if you really want tension, have the character start to realize, wait a minute, this isn't working. I am, I am running out of options. This is really bad. Um, but, you know, mystery is also a great way to do it. Like if a character is really competent, and they're going to do something really competent in an interesting way, and you want to watch them do it, little mysteries, like how are they going to do this? Setting up ahead of time. This person never is able to be persuaded. Well, how can our character be so confident that they're going to be able to do it? Um, those questions with responses, you know, set up, pay off. Um, that's just how you make any sort of writing interesting. And it works just as well in verbal sort of sparring as it would in an action scene. Uh, and I'm going to do a quick sound check on myself. I, yes. People are saying I was a little low. Let okay. me know if that sounds a little bit better, everyone. Um, did you watch Attack on Titan? I have not watched oh. Attack on Titan, except I did because people were really, um, they talked about how interesting the first episode was narratively. I watched the first episode and I agreed. It was really interesting narratively. But my friends who like anime and manga came to me and said, Brandon, I don't think you'll actually like how this thing plays out because it doesn't play out in a Brandon sort of world building way. Um, and so I just don't have a lot of time for things. Um, I thought the first episode was really interesting. Uh, nice kind of reversals, building on expectations. I think it was just one episode I watched, but uh, with some really interesting um, settings. So I wouldn't be opposed to watching more. Um, it's just finding the time. And I trust people to say, Brandon, I think you'll like this. I think you won't. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So Aaron, I tried to make it happen. Um, but that's your answer. That's your answer. <laughs> but they're just like, you should watch Attack on Titan. Uh, they were wondering uh, right. if you had a opinion on the storytelling. Oh, so uh, I thought that the first episode was interesting, right? Like there, I don't want to spoil anything, um, but there, there are some, some interesting choices that are made. And then I went and I read like the rest of the narrative um, of like the first season or whatever, which makes some really cool storytelling choices that are very dangerous to make. Um, and I honestly can't say how well they pulled it off because I haven't watched enough. Um, so, um, the book crook says a lot of writers say their stories are based off of life experiences. How do you create a detailed story that includes something you've never dealt with? So this is one of the biggest things about being a writer, right? Um, it's, um, is writing the unknown. Um, and generally it comes down to two things. Number one injecting into this unknown something familiar that you have experience with, right? None of us have lived in a fantasy world. None of us have gone to magic school, but there are going to be relatable things about magic school that are similar to the way that you went to school that you can play up your individual experience. And in almost any situation, you should be able to draw on some personal experience in some way. Um, some emotion that you feel like your emotion is going to be universal. And yeah, you may not have, for instance, um, I am not a visual artist like Shalon, right? Um, I've taken an art class here and there, but I know what it feels like to create something writing wise. And I can draw upon that passion for writing and uh, write some authentic passion for sketching. Uh, but the other thing that goes hand in hand in that is reading a lot of firsthand accounts uh, from people who do have uh, experience more close to the thing you're writing and learning to get good at um, filtering through those things and writing an authentic way. And this is not something I can answer in like a really 
simple uh, YouTube video response. Like authors spend lifetimes practicing this skill. Writing the unknown is just really difficult um, for us. And if you get good at it, it is one of those skills that just really make you stand out as a writer. Um, so, you know, make sure that what you're doing has some relatability, but basically every character I write in every situation I'm right, I'm looking for something relatable that I can understand and something I can explore uh, that is different from my life experience that I can read some primary accounts and try to kind of um, distill down those accounts into something that is universal human experience and then build it back up into a character. Then I make sure to get some early readers who have more experience with this, this thing than I do and say, hey, how did I do? What did I get wrong? Um, and that, again, will be a process that you will continue to learn about as you write more and more all through your writing career. It's like learning to show versus tell, right? That you don't you don't suddenly click and you're able to show versus tell. As a writer, you develop where you get better and better at learning when to show and when to tell. And I don't think any of us uh, stop learning in that realm. Um, so you've been asked a lot um, which of your characters is your favorite. Yes. Uh, but Laura Burnham wants to know which of your characters annoys you the most. And I'll add whether that's intentional annoyance annoys or me the most um um right now it's chet because getting him right has been really annoying and writing the third skyward book uh you'll know about that much later on theoretically um but um uh, who annoys me the most uh, i always like writing hoyd but he is annoying to write uh so i'll go with hoyd uh Annabelle asks, would you consider writing a short story about Wayne's origins? So I don't generally do this. Um, the reason being that I construct stories generally in such a way, particularly a story like um, Wayne's story that starts a little in media res. And, you know, he's already had quite a bit of life experience and some foundational things. I construct the story knowing that I'm going to give you touchstone moments through that character's narrative in a way that indicate to you what happened in the past. Um, and with Wayne, I feel like I've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, there's, there's still a little bit more for the next book, um, but I feel like if I were to go back and tell this story, uh, it would be like going back and telling Rashik's story or Lendi's story from uh, from the Mistborn series, where like the the epigraphs are there to give you the story, and if I wrote it out, it would just be really repetitive to things I've already done. Um, the characters that I'm more likely to write short stories or novels about are ones where there just isn't room in the narrative to dig into something deep about their character. Um, Rock is an excellent example of this from the Stormlight books. There's just not room, um, which is why I plan to write a Rock novella, right? To be like, all right, let's really dig into who Rock is, his past and stuff like that, because you just don't get those answers. Uh, with Wayne, I feel like I have given the answers in such a way that if I did more, it'd be boring. Good question though. Um, and did you already do this fan mail? Yes, I sorry. did that. That was this. That was the, okay, uh, the sorry. question right there. So. Had to step away for a moment. Yes. Um, uh, Ozhi Dahaka says, Brandon, I've been working through the elemental genre season of mm. writing excuses. Is sense of wonder aspect of hard versus soft magic systems distinct from wonder as genre, or is there an overlap? I think there's an overlap there. And the thing you got to remember is a lot of the elemental genre stuff, it has a lot of overlap. Um, basically, it's a it's a rubric by which we can talk about certain ideas in storytelling rather than a strict set of rules um, and a hopefully a tool that is helpful. But yes, I consider these things, the, these are basically the same, same overlap. The idea that wonder is, um, is one of those things that draws us to sci-fi fantasy, even in the more technically oriented fantasies like mine. Wonder is still a big part of it. And understanding why people feel a sense of wonder, why they're drawn to sci-fi fantasy for that wonder, um, like understanding that as a narrative device is really useful to you. And I do say like soft magic tends to have a more, little bit more sense of wonder, whereas hard magic 
tends to have a little bit more of um, problem solving, uh, satisfaction and things like that. They're just different emotions. It doesn't mean that you can't have problem solving satisfaction, which is probably a clunky way of saying it. I bet there's a better word for that in a book that has a soft magic and you can't have a sense of wonder in a book that has hard magic. Um, I would hope that my books still have plenty of sense of wonder. Those moments um, like seeing the star spread and whatnot um, in the more recent book, like there's still supposed to be moments where you're like, that is just cool and different. And, and I can see how the characters find this really beautiful and distinctive. You should be looking to have moments like that in your books, uh, particularly if you're writing sci-fi fantasy, but like a lot of different genres, that, that sense of wonder, going a place that you couldn't actually ever go physically um, is part of why we enjoy reading and writing sci-fi fantasy. So uh, yes, there is overlap. And I think that the question there might have been along the lines of, uh, do you not have sense of wonder in a hard magic system? And that is not true. You definitely have sense of wonder. Maybe a little bit less um, to certain aspects of the story, but sense of wonder is still a driving force in a fantasy book, no matter how well you explain the magic. Uh, David says, and this I think will be good uh, practice or good for Kathy, our wonderful good friend Kathy to hear. Um, how do you tell someone like Dan that you know well and are close friends with that you don't like the book they wrote? Yeah, that is kind of hard, um, right? Like this happens um, that, you know, you just don't, don't enjoy a book. I've had good friends who have written books that just weren't for me. Um, that they asked for a cover blurb on, and I'd be like, you know what? This is the wrong one for me to cover blurb. Use one of my other mini blurbs that I've given you on other books. Um, and the more professional you are, and the more you do this, the more you're going to realize that'll just happen, right? Like certain books just will not click for you. That's okay. There are books of mine that Peter, my editorial director, doesn't like. Not any books, but he doesn't like the story dreamer um, uh, at all. And there are books of mine that Joshua has not really liked um, because Joshua tends to not like the big, thick epic fantasies. He would, I think, rather that I was writing them all at 150,000 or 200,000 words and uh, things that get really long. Sometimes he's like, I don't know. And I'm like, no, this is right. This is the artistic vision I want to have for this story. It's, uh, it is a good story, even if Joshua doesn't necessarily like this one. Um, and um, that's really hard both to hear and to say. And um, I think framing it as this one isn't working for me. It's different if the author has written a book that they think you should like and you don't versus something that's wildly different. Like if your friend writes a horror novel and you don't read a lot of horror and you read it and you're like, this just isn't my thing, that's easy, right? Everybody knows that people have different tastes, but when they write something that you probably should like and you just don't, sometimes you have to be like, you know what? Not my favorite. Um, maybe get some other, some second opinions and things, but for the, me, this one just didn't work. And then tell them why. Uh, and if they're a pro, they can probably take it. Some pros, it's very difficult to hear things like that. And that's not necessarily a failing on their part. We just all have different psychology. Those authors need to learn how to get feedback in a way that's helpful to them uh, and maybe not get it directly from people, even from their friends, maybe have it filtered through like a spouse or something like that. Um, but yeah, it is rough. Um, and really it, it'll also depend on, do you think they actually want to hear from you, right? Like a new writer who is on their first book or their second book may not want to or need to hear from you that you just don't like their book. Um, they just may not have the skill yet like I just went to my son's um, concert. He is, this is Joel, he's 13. He's been playing trombone for less than a year. And you know what, for seventh graders, it was a really good concert. He did a great job. Um, like he doesn't need to hear, oh, some of the, the band was off tune, right? Some of the woodwinds were squeaking, um, you know, like of course they were, they're seventh graders, right? And your friend who's just written a first novel um, doesn't need to hear from you, pr probably. You know what? This is not professional caliber. I wouldn't spend money on this. They need to hear. It's amazing that you were able to do this thing and hear the parts of it that really worked for me. Um, 
And, you know, you might say, that's pulling punches. Don't they need to hear it? Well, you can just have them watch one of my things where I explain that your first few books are generally terrible and that you should treat them as learning experiences. And for almost all of us, that is the case. And you should, you know, you should know as a new writer already that your first book is probably not the masterpiece that you imagine it is. Um, and so really as a new author, encouragement might be the right thing. So it depends on where they are in their, their life, depends on what they're looking for. Like um, a lot of authors I know do not want to get the criticism from their spouse. They just want their spouse to read the book and be like, you know what? This is awesome. Good job. I love this part. And then the editor and agent and writing group can tear it to pieces. At least they have one person cheering for them. And that might be you. That might be your friend. That is okay. Like you don't, you don't have to get harsh criticism from every angle. You're not a weak person if you don't want to get harsh criticism from your spouse on your book that you've poured two years of your life into or something like that. So uh, just learn to kind of to balance these things as a writer, figure out where you can get that constructive criticism and where you don't want it. And as a friend, uh, it can be tough to walk these, these lines. I am in a realm where most of my writing friends, all my writing friends have been doing this for years. And they are totally fine hearing from me. This isn't my favorite book. I didn't really like this one. It doesn't happen very often, uh, but it has happened uh, for even my my some of my really good friends. So, uh, and in all seriousness, I wish I could make fun of Kathy for her writing, but yeah. she is a great writer. Yeah, her book is really good. Um, uh, it is it is legitimately uh, a great book. Uh, this newest one is even better than her previous one. If she will just finish it, um, I think everybody will love to read it. But Kathy, uh, Kathy writes at a Kathy speed. Yes. Everyone motivate Kathy to write faster than Kathy speed. Just joking. <laughs> and she'll do it at her own pace. Yes, but she will she's a great writer. Um, and the thing about Kathy is her first book, Kathy, you know this, her first book was kind of a disaster. Um, and she jumped into the deep end by coming to my writing group. Right. And my writing group, you've not just got me, you've got Peter and Karen who are, you know, professional editors, long term professional editors who are um, very good at being blunt. That's one of their job descriptions is be blunt about what needs to be fixed. And so you come and you join in with this and you've got us, you've got Eric and Darcy Stone, who are both um, writing professional caliber work. Uh, Darcy won Writers of the Future recently, and uh, Eric has been published a bunch of times and won the Nebula Award. Like, these are really good writers, and, you know, you've got uh, other people in the writing group who are dedicated amateurs who write for fun but are also just really good at writing, and it's not intended to be their career. They do it because they want to, um, and we've all been together for a long time, and uh, Kathy comes and turns in a book that you know had good parts to it she's she was a good writer even then but it was a disaster right all of our first books are and this one was a pretty enormous disaster and she just took it like a champ and soldiered through and then wrote her next book which was really good like most of us, it took me six to start getting good. Kathy did it on her second book. And now her third one's just really good. Yeah, I was furious when yeah. I read that first chapter. I was like, yeah. this is not fair. No, yeah. <laughs> uh, Adam's in a writing group with her right now. Uh, and, and a lot of these people here uh, are in the writing group uh, together. And they, they have to deal with the fact that Kathy went through the crucible and came out the other end uh, and then just upped her game yeah. Though and, I will say it is a little unfair that she took this book to your writing group and, yes. and, and fixed then, it and then brought it to yeah, our writing yeah. group. Uh, it's set an unfair precedence. Ah, oh, I got a, a, a letter from Taiwan. Um, let's see. Um, is this... Um, Oh, this is Yayi. I don't know if I re uh, remember you as much. I'll have to read the, the letter. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. You're Fiki's sister. Okay. I do remember you. Oh, I'm at this camera now. I do remember you. Say hi to Fiki for me. Uh, you guys took such good care of me when I came to Taiwan. Uh, it's been 10 years <laughs> since. Oh, man. I'm, we're, we're all old now. Um, 
Um, but um, you have sent me, oh, let, I'll open that in a second. Let's do, um, let's see. Oh, you guys, uh, um, I'm sure my pronunciation is getting worse and worse over the years, but uh, we just had the Lunar New Year. Um, let's see. All right. So um, I have been sent a Lunar New Year gift. I'm going to show the face. What's that? Oh, maybe if they want to see the face. I don't know. The face? Oh, the face of what you're opening. Oh, okay. Well, it's just... I don't know. I, I didn't know what yes. it was. So, so we're going we're gonna to open this, and we are going to show off mm. some cards with chickens on them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful little chickens on them. Um, so um, Yai says that the bigger one, Chun, means spring. So here's spring. And uh, an inverted one means good fortune is coming. Smaller one means good fortune and blessings. Fu, uh, fu. I don't know my tones. I'm sorry. Um, but it it's um, inversion in Mandarin Dao, which has the same pronunciation as uh, coming. So it means good fortune is coming. Uh, so is spring chicken a worldwide term? I don't know, but there there's totally a macaw on this. So that's pretty cool. We've got all different types of chromatic chickens on here. Um, so we've got a Quaker parrot, we've got a parakeet, and we've got a cockatiel. And what is that? That looks like some sort of cockatoo. Uh, but um, thank you so much. Give my best to the family. Um, uh, <laughs> it is the epilogue, oh, epilogue of Stormlight 5 will still be written in Wit's viewpoint. I'm going to raffo you on that one. Uh, you'll have to wait and see. I will be writing it very soon. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. What happens? Uh, I mean, uh, yes. So these are all spoiler things. I'll try to write out an answer to you that we can send um, back to you uh, because I don't want to answer that one on stream because it spoils some stuff for Stormlight 4. Um, but uh, I look forward to reading this. Um, you guys are great. Hopefully, I can get back to Taiwan at some point. Um, I really loved my visits to Taiwan and uh, give my best to Fiki. Uh, and um, someone needs to tell me a good place uh, to get uh, to get boba tea um, here in uh, American Fork because my favorite place closed down, um, and so I just can't get it. Do they? Yeah. Um, yeah, we will need to get it for the stream one of these times. That's what we should do. Is we should get some uh, some bubble tea um, and uh, and drink it on stream because I'm missing it. And I, uh, you know, both times I went to Taiwan uh, was were around Lunar New Year, and everyone was drinking uh, bubble tea quite a bit or boba tea, um, and so I miss it. We had a really great place that would make. Uh, really good ones so anyway uh let's go on with other questions uh uh well, i had a great one saved and then my the app i'm running decided to remove it but let's see if i can uh, paraphrase it they were okay. wondering uh what your thoughts were on the arc of anakin skywalker okay uh, and do you think that it only worked because it was played out over uh, the course of several films so anakin skywalker's arc is good in concept um, um, I don't, you know, the execution, I'm one of those people who thinks that the prequels just could have used some better execution, right? Um, a lot of people that I know that are big Star Wars fans talk about filling in the holes with some of the animated series, uh, that really help. Um, and even the short one I watched, the Gendy Kar Tarkovsky, uh, short sequence had some Anakin ones that really helped kind of connect the dots a little bit more. Um, but I think in concept, it is a good arc. It is a good idea. Um, the motivation for what happens is good. Um, I don't think I would have shown him the way you made the movie, killing the young ones. That's the thing I probably would not have done um, because he was... See, what happens here is you're making your, your hero turn villainous for good reasons. That's dangerous because... Um, on one hand, it's good because it makes his redemption more satisfying, but on the other hand, it reframes Darth Vader to us, right? Darth Vader was someone who was corrupted by the dark side of the force. So it wasn't power in the movies. 
that corrupted him so much as love, theoretically. And the filling in of a lot of the other things indicate, no, this is a guy who was really angry, really mad at the world, uh, really did want power. And kind of this whole thing with, uh, with his wife was more an excuse than it was the driving force. And that works better, right? That's a guy that I can be like, all right, you can, you can do this. But man, killing the younglings, there, there are certain things. Like blowing up a planet is strangely less vilifying for a character than showing a cute little kid um, and having your main character, like, you know, murder them like have you guys seen that that meme now that's like obi-wan gets out um uh anakin skywalker's lightsaber with luke that first time he's like this was your fa father's lightsaber he killed 20 children with it here you go like <laughs> treasure it treasure it this bloody weapon of destruction um like uh something about all of that just did not work very well for me um but it might have been the execution. I think on paper it works well. But I think the biggest change, and I'm not the first one to say this. I've, I've cribbed this off of other people, is that if the prequels had been Obi-Wan's story, if they'd been framed more from his viewpoint, they just would have been stronger all around. Um, and um, number one, uh, Ewan McGregor is the one who just nailed the acting in that series. Uh, it was, it was a, much harder for other people to act according to Lucas's direction because of the new ways of filming and all the green screening and things like that. Some very good actors gave sometimes weaker performances, but man, he just nailed it. So that would have helped a ton. But what also would have helped is, you know, watching Obi-Wan's heartbreak over losing his beloved apprentice is a much more compelling story for a protagonist than watching Anakin Skywalker become Anakin Skywalker. Um, and... That's partially because of the way the force is set up, right? Like, it's this weird thing where once you become a villain, you basically stop being the person you were and are completely like a switch has been flipped. It's like happens, actually, now I'm reading this, the, I'm signing the uh, Gathering Storm. It's like what happens in this where, you know, you people can be turned to evil, um, but... When it happens in the books, I just philosophically have to write it as their soul is gone and a new soul is in it because I just can't, like, being forced to become evil, um, I can't imagine with my understanding of free will that actually being a thing that can happen. Um, and it feels like in what he had set up is, like, once you turn to the dark side, you basically are no longer the same individual. Your morals are out the window. You are now captured by the dark side and you are willing to do any evil thing at all that the dark side wants you to do. And that makes it rough um, because this story of a good person who gets, who falls for good reasons just doesn't work um, in my mind in that narrative um, because like that sort of story where you're supposed to feel sympathy for the person turning but the sympathy, the person is not turning. The person is being murdered by another spirit of demon who takes over their body, essentially. And they lose all free will um, and all sense of morals they once had. It's so weird. But it's also not that. Like, Lucas felt like he didn't want to go all the way in on that. Um, even though that's how... And I'll be honest, guys. I'm basing a little bit of this on the expanded universe stuff that I read and the, the role-playing books and stuff that I read, and I know it's not all there in the movies, but that's how it felt to me, even in the movies, that he wanted it to go. Like, um, you get corrupted by the dark side, and in a role-playing game, you then, if you get corrupted by the dark side, you hand your character sheet to the DM, you don't run a bad guy, because you are no longer the same person. Um, and, boy, we're, I'm ranting about Star Wars again. But this is kind of how those prequels, like, on paper, it's a good idea person really wants to save their loved ones, looks to forbidden power. The forbidden power corrupts them um, to the point that they are no longer the person that their loved ones would want to spend their lives with. Um, and then out of anger and fear, you drive further into that dark place because the character is really mad that they feel like they've sacrificed everything for these people and then they don't, they don't care. They would, you know... And that's a really relatable story. It kind of relates to the whole idea of a parent 
who spends all their life working to make a better life for their kids when their kids just wanted to spend time with them. Like that's a really relatable thing that I think a lot of us can understand. Um, and something about it in, in the, the film series with the world building together just did not click for me. Um, and so, so anyway, on paper, I think it's a great idea in execution. I don't think it flew. Um, it did just didn't, I, I don't think it landed, I should say. Um, so, uh, this one here has a scratch on the spine. Okay. Uh, just set that, I want to set that one and make a note of it. Yeah. I'd uh, like all of you to meet our quality control manager, oh, uh, Brandon Sanderson. That one. So, uh, <laughs> these ones are returns. It looks like yeah. no, it's not all of them. A couple of them are, so they've been shipped around a bunch. So they might have weaker or more ruined spines or spines jack dust jackets and you know while we have a little bit of a break mm -hmm. um kara how long do you think it will be before we have these up on the website will it be tomorrow or are you thinking friday um, I would say tomorrow. okay tomorrow. all right so it's if you're morning. okay so, so if you're looking for a signed uh sanderson book check uh they the web store tomorrow, tomorrow. Uh, last time they sold out in four days um yeah. but Granted, we hadn't had them up for a while because getting them in has been hard because of COVID. Uh, plus, we had, you know, 25,000 uh, leather-bound Way of Kings books to sign. So uh, that's that. They kept us distracted. What's that? They're actually they're being sewn. 2021s are being sewn? Great. So they're going to start shipping. Like The next month. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah, and if you're still waiting for your uh, your swag, we're getting really close on that too, um, because we we have the copies of Way of Kings Prime, I believe. No. Oh, just Don Sharp. We got the cover for Way of Kings Prime. That's what Isaac showed. Yeah. Yeah, we got the cover proof, so we know that the covers look good, and they're printing those and sending. Them. So we have to get those. Yeah, they're binding those, and we have to get the playing cards. We got the proofs of those. Yeah. But we have to get those printed. Those are probably going to be the slowest still. Slower. And the, the coins are almost ready, right? They're almost. You should get them this month. Yeah. So, so we're waiting on those three things. And as those get checked off, then we'll finally be able to ship everything uh, to you. But if we're lucky, we're looking at June-ish. We're hoping, but we can't promise anything, obviously. Yeah, it takes a long time for that to ship them, ship them. Yeah. But we should be able to start shipping most things in May and June. May and June. That's the goal. Uh, it would be really awesome. Like our one of our big goals is if we can get them shipped or at least starting shipping by the time we hit the one year mark of the Kickstarter, yeah. that'll feel really good. Like if we could get them all shipped by then, that would be awesome. That would be um, awesome. But and then we can start looking towards the next one. Uh, yes, then we have <laughs> words of radiance. <laughs> that that won't be next year. No, 2023. 2023. We'll give the whole team a time to to take a deep breath. And then uh, we'll we'll get working on Words of Radiance. I did look at some art for the Wax and Wayne uh, one, which I think we're doing next year. Next year. Uh, we should be doing um, Alloy of Lot and uh, Shadows of Self together is what I think we're doing. Yeah. Uh, separate volumes in a slipcase, maybe? I think that's... Oh, it's, oh, it's one oh, of those... A ribbon or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you banded. Yeah, that's that's a better idea because we don't want misborn books to be like, Mistborn, Mistborn, case, case, Mistborn. Like, yeah. yeah. So they'll just come wrapped together. A package. A package together um, in two volumes. That was what um, most people seemed to like the idea of two volumes. The, the least popular in the poll was one volume. The most popular was two volumes sold together. And in the middle was two volumes, two separate years. So we're just going with the idea that people do want two volumes. And we think we can package them together um, in a way that'll that'll just save a little money for everyone. So, yeah. um, Adam Scott has an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, "How essential is a new magic system in writing a novel? Are simple spells and witchcraft not an option for publishers today?" Uh, there is totally still an option. Um, so it depends on the type of story you're doing and your subgenre, and really what you want your selling point to be. Uh, for instance, um, I think a cool, interesting magic point, magic system, uh, can always be a selling point no matter your subgenre. But there are times where, for instance, you might be writing a romance novel where you're like, the focus of this 
is not on the magic system. The focus is this is, you know, she's a witch, right? And this is what witchcraft is to me. Uh, just some very simple, soft rules. And then we go forward. Um, like Sanderson's law talks about this idea that foreshadowing using the, the rules of magic are there kind of to help you solve problems with your magic in a satisfying way. Um, but yeah, um, these are still like Avatar The Last Airbender, I often go back to as one of the most influential pieces of fantasy media um, in, uh, in recent memory. And it used a very standard Aristotelian magic system. Um, the, you know, classic elements from Greek philosophy. Um, and did it just did it really well. Um, and I think you could do something like that uh, with, you know, just casting spells or witchcraft or things like that. Like, uh, if you have strong characters and your magic enhances your story, then it doesn't matter what your magic is. Your magic is, you know, um, now one of the things is that as I have risen to prominence in the genre, uh, interesting and distinctive magic systems have become a selling point because the market has adapted slightly to me. Right. Um, which is a weird thing to be saying, but it did it to George in the late two nineties and early two thousands and still is a little bit to an extent, but, um, because of that, uh, you do see that a cool magic system is a more bankable thing than it used to be. It was always kind of cool, but now it's like, you can say like Brandon Sanderson and it's a little bit more sellable, but there's going to be an equally large reaction against Sanderson style magic. Cause if I do something and then everybody starts doing it, then suddenly it'll become cliche, right? Like, um, and people will be tired of it. Uh, just like they were kind of a little bit tired of grimdark, which is why um, when I did non-Grimdark, when I did, it was actually, some people found it refreshing, which uh, was, was kind of cool because I had thought it might be treated as old hat and kind of old fashioned, but these things go in cycles, right? So the answer is anything done well with passion by you um, is going to work. And anything that enhances your story is a good idea, regardless of, what trends may be or whatnot. Um, and you can absolutely still do a kind of one of these classical standard magic systems. But remember the D&D &D magic um, was, you know, something someone actively came up with. It was, uh, oh, what's his name? Demon Prince uh, books. Scar's favorite author, um, Jack Vance. Jack Vance came up with what became the D&D &D magic system. He wrote a book and the people who made D&D are like, that's cool. I guess we'll do wizards that way. Um, and uh, then it became kind of the standard thing. But it was really fresh and interesting. When he came up with you memorize spells and then they vanish from your mind after you cast them and you have to rememorize them, that was an innovative magic system at one point. Uh, and there's still a lot of interesting room to play with something like that. So uh, don't, don't get hung up on your magic system too much. Like I, I've become known as the magic system guy partially because I carved out a little niche for myself around something that I enjoy doing. Um, and that's useful for marketing language. Um, and it's useful for helping you. But what you want to be doing is telling really great stories about interesting characters. Um, and you want to be using your setting to enhance that. And, you know, one of the things I did was kind of become the magic system guy um, because there wasn't one, right? And it was something I felt I was good at. But don't get hung up on that, right? If you're going to practice anything, practice writing great stories, whatever that means to you. And then once you kind of find a theme of things you're doing well, perhaps you can find some sort of marketing angle to, to brand yourself in a certain way. Um, and it's really handy for marketing. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, George is the grimdark epic fantasy guy, right? No, George is the guy who writes really compelling stories about interesting characters. And marketing-wise, it's very useful to say this is the person who founded the modern grimdark movement in, uh, in fantasy. Uh, very useful, and it does help people kind of understand, hey, if I like George, what else will I like? Oh, you might like Joe Abercrombie or, you know, one of these other authors who's kind of um, influenced by George and took grimdark in interesting different directions. But that's more a marketing thing, right? Um, at the end of the day, write great stories. 
um, and uh, write things, write them the way that you're passionate about writing them. Yeah, do one more slide. We're gonna do one more table after one this. One more table after this. And, done. and then we're done. And we literally have to order more. Okay, <laughs> that's why I've signed everything. Oh, yes. Ah. So in two weeks, we will probably be signing uh, leather bounds again, huh? They come in tomorrow. They come in tomorrow. Awesome. So what are we getting in tomorrow? All of them. All of them. So oh. We will, we will pick which ones you do first, and then we'll send yeah. them back to the library as they get done. Great. <laughs> Excellent. We will have leather bounds back in stock in like six months <laughs> after I sign them and they bind them. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, it's a time-consuming process. I it think. is a time-consuming process, especially in the the global distribution network yes. in its current status. But I've really enjoyed streaming. It's been a nice way to use this time. Uh, yeah, you used to have to just do all of this basically alone. Yeah, I mean, I would listen to hardcore history or uh, a novel. You know, I need uh, that last episode to come out. Have you mm, been, have you been yes. following it up? Oh, uh -huh. so good. Yeah. So, but yeah, uh, this is this is. Uh, a, an effective use of our time, and it's been very fun. People seem to enjoy uh, connecting with us on this sort of thing. So, so yeah, thanks you guys for uh, for hanging out. We're almost two hundred thousand. I looked the other yeah, day, um, close. Which uh, I think I'm gonna have to do another giveaway. Yeah, uh, I have a, a special something in my closet. Oh. Uh, first edition, first printing, Warbreaker leather bound, signed and numbered. Ooh, that I think I will. Oh, be, that'll, uh, that'll be a good giveaway. Yeah. Um. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, last question, probably. Probably. Well, last. I, I think this one yeah. could be. So, uh, Eboff the Chill says, Brandon, you've talked about stories seeming like a traditional genre and then turning on their head being bad if you take too long and don't hit at it. How would you signpost that? And do you have examples? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, what the uh, the questioner is asking is some, like, it's usually good to have cool reversals in your stories. That is a really good idea, right? Um, you, But at the same time, it can be dangerous if you are switching genres entirely. Um, particularly, you know, the example I always say is imagine a story that's kind of a, a very standard classic quest fantasy um, that at the three quarter marks, the author upends into something completely different and doesn't give the satisfying endings. You could easily end up with a book that nobody likes. The people who want genre um, bending sort of uh, and upending of conventions aren't going to get there because the opening is too standard. And the people who love a standard quest fantasy will hate your ending because it doesn't give them the things that they are promised. And the, the, the counter example I often use is Into the Woods uh, by Sondheim, which basically does this and makes it the big selling point. Halfway through, it changes genres entirely and gives you a different ending than the opening seems to promise. Um, and so kind of studying those two examples probably will help you. Uh, some of the things that I would say that will help you is, number one, don't wait till the three-quarter mark to have your big reversal. Like if your big reversal can happen um, at the um, at the midpoint or the one third point, you're just gonna be way stronger. Um, and a good example of this is who we were talking about earlier, George, right? Uh, Game of Thrones, the first book um, is, uh, exists in part now, you may not feel like this now if you're reading it now, but it was a strong reaction against fantasy of the era right? Um, and what happens is in fantasy of the era, you generally would have one of two people as you read those first chapters that would be the heroes of your story. It's either going to be the, um, the father figure, Eddard Stark, um, who is, you know, kind of, um, you know, the, the grizzled veteran, or it's going to be the young kid. And most people will be like, it's the young kid that I've read this fantasy book before the young kid is going to um, is going to be our protagonist, and so what does George do? He throws the kid out a window, like in the first third somewhere, breaks his back, and then doesn't really spend any more time on him. And you're like, oh, the character who is going to be the hero in my brain that fantasy stories have taught me is not the hero of this story. He's, you know, this look is turning out to be an ensemble cast, and maybe he has a part in it, but 
that's interesting. And it really upends conventions early on. Then you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. And then he just kind of, um, the way he kills Eddard Stark is like, here I am killing the refuge, the refuges, refuges, the, um, the remnants, the remnants of your belief that this is going to be a standard epic fantasy by now, not just killing this person, but by humiliating them first and then killing them. And then everyone's like, well, I've got this figured out. You did a bait and switch. It's actually the eldest son who's going to be the hero. And then the Red Wedding happens. And you're like, oh, I have no idea what this book is about. Oh, it turns out that the villains are the protagonists and the heroes. And uh, George is going to make me love them. Like, that is a really interesting reversal um, that he was playing into. And he was very quick early on to signpost that, right? Like, you knew, like, even when um, when Bran got thrown out the window, you knew already this wasn't a standard fantasy because um, of the just, like, the grim, dark sense to it from the get-go. It had a different air. Um, that's probably the best way to do it, right? Um, is to, to be very clear that you're not doing this. Like, but if you really want the kind of bait and switch, you kind of have to hang a lantern on it by either being overly cutesy with it. Like this is kind of the, um, the Terry Pratchett way where it's like, this is too obviously the trope. So where's the reversal going to happen? And then when he does it, you're like, oh, that's a clever way to do that reversal, Terry. Um, you, you hung a lantern on it. You shone a light and said, by the way, I know this is tropey and that's the joke. Um, stay with me and you'll get the punchline, um, in a little bit. Um, and if you really want to just kick people in the face and do a complete reversal, understand that you might lose your audience, but Sondheim proves that you can do it and, um, and not foreshadow and have it kind of become um, the selling point um, that, uh, of, of that thing. Like some people, um, and to an extent, all of us to a smaller extent, like to have something kick us in the face. Um, and surprise us that much. Um, and really what's going to separate the Sondheim from the non-Sondheim. Um, another thing that does this, I don't, you know, I'm not terribly familiar, but I understand like there's a video game that you can play on uh, Steam that someone explained to me um, that is about a bunch of cute little anime girls who have a, have a book club. Um, and halfway through, it turns into a very different story. Um, um, you know, these sorts of things can gain a huge amount of traction because they are such an undermining of, um, of tropes and things. And that can be a real selling point. Um, and you just have to be okay with the fact that you are going to annoy and turn off a portion of your audience and hope that the ones you don't turn off are so impressed with your ability to do this that they make it a big selling point of the story. Um, and I would say the difference between Sondheim and people who don't do this well is the quality of the storytelling. Like if your quality of storytelling is really good and that classic quest fantasy had characters that you just loved and then the big reversal happens and you can follow their shock and you're on board with it as they realize they're not getting the happy ending they wanted, but you still are invested in them, then that story could be really powerful um, and could work really well even though there's a certain segment of the audience who's just probably not going to read anymore. Um, like uh, I've mentioned before, I didn't keep reading Game of Thrones. Uh, it wasn't really Eddard that did it to me. It was Daenerys's plot. Um, just I was not interested in a story that did to a 14-year-old girl or a, I think she might have even been 13 or something, like Young. Uh, a, a child essentially what that narrative did. I appreciated the writing and said, I'm done. This is not for me. Um, but it obviously worked for a huge portion of the audience uh, who like epic fantasy and became one of the touchstone fantasy books, basically of all time, right? Like it'll be when you're writing the history of epic fantasy as a genre, George Martin gets his own section um, because of how he changed the genre. Um, and so you'll lose some Brandons and you'll gain other people when you do things like this. And the quality of your storytelling is going to determine what that percentage is like even me walking away from game of thrones I'm like wow this is really well written um and i went and read a bunch more george's short stories because in short story form i happen to really like that style of storytelling um 
but uh, I didn't keep reading Game of Thrones, but you'll notice I know what happens in the future books because I had to go figure out. I had to go read the summaries when they all came out uh, because he's such a compelling writer. Um, and so uh, that was also partially because it's my job to keep up on what the big fantasy series are doing. Um, but regardless, you know, do what you want to do. Understand the dangers of doing it and how to compensate for them. In this case, either hang a lantern on it, do it earlier than your uh, instincts might say, or just do a really good job of making us love the character so that we can't help but continue on even when things uh, turn out different for the story. But most stories that do this successfully, there are hints. Like even in Into the Woods, I think you watch that and you're like, he's playing with me. I know he's playing with me. This is Sondheim, right? That's the other thing you can't separate from Into the Woods. This is Sondheim. He wrote a book about a guy who, or a, a play about a guy who slits throats and bakes people into pies. I don't think this is going to be as cutesy as it's pretending to be. Uh, when Jack is singing that song, I that song is telling me Jack is being set up for disappointment, um, uh, as pretty as that song is. And so I think that even in a lot of things, they, they're more like George, where from the get-go, I was not surprised by what happened to Eddard thematically, I was impressed that the book was willing to go there, if that makes sense. Um, and so you can have twists that are that are still foreshadowed, but still shocking in that you're like, wow, he really went there. Wow, he is killing every character that would have been the hero of another fantasy story. And he's making you love the people who do it. That's different. Um, so that that's something I think you can take from George's writing, even if, uh, like me, Game of Thrones was not necessarily the piece of art for you. Uh, either way, uh, thank you, guys. Um, we will be back in two weeks. I don't know if we'll have a guest or not. Uh, we shall see. Um, but either way, uh, there will be stuff for me to sign. And so we will see you then. Take care.